I have a little kid who is 10 right now who hasn't decided what to do. I think it's going to be in data management. <laughs> this is the future. <laughs> yeah. A professional spy. <laughs> mine mine want to be a gardener. <laughs> okay, welcome all. Thank you for joining me. My name is Professor Tim Campbell. I'm a visiting professor of international management at the University of Northampton. And what I wanted to do today is a very short food for thought, if you like, session of something we talk about in MBA classrooms. What I'm really going to be talking about is motivation and job satisfaction, but particularly in the context of remote working. And the reason why I picked this topic, this is a very typical sort of discussion we'd have in one of the workshops, is because it's so relevant to us today. I have been reading almost every day uh, lessons, advice, statistics about teleworking or remote working or whatever you want to call it. I'll mention more about that in a moment. And on the, on the newspapers, on websites, it seems to be everywhere these days. And what I found when I compare what a lot of these trainers, consultants, opinion pieces, all these types of things, what they're saying often doesn't particularly match with what we know from our academic research. So my little food for thought session is I'm going to look at the academic research on teleworking pre-COVID-19, so before this all came along and forced us to be all teleworkers, because before that came along, it was something people would choose to do if their organization offered it, or is something that people would be attracted to, those types of occup occupations and organizations. It was something that was more or less voluntary. Now it's not. We're all forced down that road. So it's quite a different situation. So let's see what we can learn from what we knew at that particular time. We're going to look at the academic literature on the benefits and the limitations. I'm going to give you a takeaway and that I hope will give us some sort of discussion about what you think about how it's all working for you guys. Let us begin with what is a teleworker? Because this actually feeds into the fact that we're getting such differing advice and differing results and statistics because we can't even agree on the term itself. You'll hear teleworker, you'll hear telecommuter, you'll hear remote worker, you'll hear ICT mobile worker, and you'll hear lots of other different terms. Sometimes they're used interchangeably and they mean essentially the same thing. Sometimes the authors will argue they actually mean slightly different things. Now that already gives us a difficult starting point for when we're trying to compare different research and statistics because we're not even starting with the same term. The other issue is there is no one way of characterizing a teleworker. If I'm away out of the office for one day, does that make me a teleworker or does it have to be five days? What if I'm outside of the office the majority of the time meeting clients? Does that make me a teleworker? What if I'm a freelancer working from home? What if I'm self-employed? What if, what if, what if? So the problem is, again, researchers use different criteria to define what it is. And that also feeds into the vast variety of different results we get. So for our purposes, I'm going to use the European Union data, because whatever you think about the European Union, they collect some great data, and they have done for years now. They've been collecting data on teleworkers since at least 2005. And the great thing is, they use the same criteria every single time. So it means we can make some assumptions from their trends that they, we see. By the way, their criteria uh, for them, a teleworker is somebody who spends more than three quarters of their time outside of the main office or the main place of work, either on a daily or a weekly basis. So according to the European Union data, we've got about 17% of the European workforce regularly or occasionally spend more than three quarters of the day or week outside of the office. Uh, Dr. Campbell, uh, may I ask a question, please? You sure can. Would a salesman or a sales manager who's spending most of his time going around be considered as a teleworker? Uh, if, if they would surely spend more than three quarters of their time outside the office. So, that's right. So according to the EU's criteria, they would. But you will uh -huh. probably read other studies where they wouldn't be included. 
So that's where this, this problem comes. Whenever you're looking at research or looking at the, in anything, statistics or on the newspapers about teleworkers, you need to begin with what are they actually defining as a teleworker? So according to the EU, that does fit. And it is common in professional clerical and sales pro uh, professions. It's almost unheard of in agriculture, fisheries, construction, manufacturing, these types of places. And that's another problem with a lot of statistics that we'll read about in the newspapers. Often they don't even consider the blue collar types of occupations. So we get much inflated figures of how many people are actually teleworking because they're really only looking at professionals or office workers. So the EU looks at all of the different industries. Now there's been an upward trend from about 20, 2005 to 2015. Teleworking boomed around the world and it was driven by the tech companies, the Yahoo's of this world, and uh, the Googles and these types of, uh, of organizations that all of a sudden thought that this is a pretty good thing to do. They thought it's going to help in a lot of different ways that we'll see in a moment. But it's actually plateaued in about the last five years. We've not seen any great increase in teleworking across the EU. So let's have a look at our research evidence, our academic research evidence, bearing in mind all of these limitations I've mentioned. Now, the things you'll read about teleworking is almost universally positive. Now, that's not the case. It is, gen um, if we look at a vast, a vast range of hundreds of different research studies, it is mostly positively related to job satisfaction and motivation. But you've got to bear in mind the sample is largely self-selecting. The people who, you are, who are actually doing teleworking are people who have the option to do so, have asked to do so, or have been attracted to occupations that offer it. So when you're trying to compare between people who telework and their job satisfaction and people who don't, you're really not comparing like for like. So it's not a surprise really that these people do show higher positive job satisfaction. We also see some negative aspects that relate to job satisfaction and motivation, which I'll talk about in a moment. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. As I said, it's just food for thought. But if we look at the academic literature, we do see reduction in stress and reductions in turnover and tensions. Generally, we see improvements in work family conflicts, but we tend to see that being less for more regular teleworkers. The people that do it all the time can actually sometimes report higher work family conflicts simply because they're higher, around higher the divorce rates. The <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps some of us are experiencing it right now. now. For some people who are actually spending all of their time in a home based environment with the work and family, we can actually see in some instances that actually increases our work family conflict. But if we look at many, many studies, we do find generally there's improvement. And something that's often we see uh, these days, there are natural environmental benefits, of course. People aren't commuting so much to work and these types of things, which is good for the climate and the environment. Now, on to the negative things. The things that do tend to pop out of the literature is that can lead to social loafing. What we mean by that, people can get away because they're not being monitored as closely with not doing as much as when in the part of an organization as a team and other people will, will pick up the slack for them because of the difficulties of monitoring. We also find our teleworkers, they work longer hours than people do in the office. And again, if you think of ourselves doing this, you may find you get out of bed and you go straight into your computer at home. So you might find you're actually an hour and a half earlier than you would be normally for work. And this is something we see. We do see teleworkers do tend to report longer hours. Sometimes, again, European Union data shows us they work between five or seven hours more a week than those who don't. Now, there's a couple of social issues here. Feelings of isolation, and there can be a reduction in motivation. Now, we don't have to look far to find out what the reasons for that might be. And I'm going to show you one of our most famous of all management models, that of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and his human motivation that he put out there in the 1940s. One of the very first models of motivation that we saw and that we saw appearing in management textbooks. Now there are many, many hundreds and thousands of them since. But if we just use Maslow as an example, he talked about human motivation, not necessarily employee motivation. 
But anyway, he said there's five needs that motivate us. Down the bottom, we're motivated by lower level needs. We're motivated by food, drink, security, money, these types of things. But as next level is we're motivated as humans, social needs, relationships, seeing other people, family. And then above that, he has some esteem, which is status recognition and being all you can be at the top. Now, I don't want to particularly go into the criticism of Maslow's work or talk about the validity of it. All I want you to see is where's my big arrow? Social. And all of these motivation theories that we've known for so long, social needs have been a big part of them. When people work from home, you're pulling that away from them. An interesting survey, actually, of the American workforce is called the Valentine's Day Survey, where they survey how many people date co-workers. And in the last time this was done on Valentine's Day, 41% of employees said that they have dated a co-worker. The point wow. here is don't wow. forget the social needs. It's an important part of people's life. So when I go back here and I talk about feelings of isolation, reductions of motivation, motivation theories have been talking about this for a long time. We can't forget about these issues. So the food for thought for you guys, it can make a lot of sense, but it needs to be carefully considered and, man and managed. It's not for everybody. It's not for every job. And even organizations themselves need to have the right culture and climate to really to make it work. Professor, I have a question, please. Personally, yes. Uh, the previous slide was, uh, was clear, yes, but don't you think that it's too early to generalize the whole case of teleworking since, yes, it was the case in some, some professions or some particular uh, jobs that they can work tele as, as a teleworkers. But now, like, I don't have the data, but I assume like 90% of the... Of, of the of planet Earth are, are working from home, or, or a big, uh, big ratio. So don't you think that it's still too early to, to, uh, to generalize? Yes, now that's a good question, because of course, what I've been telling you is what happened up until COVID. This is when this is more of a voluntary thing, as I mentioned. Now we're all doing our own experiment, aren't we? It's almost an enforced global experiment. Go out yeah. there, telework. And the sorts of results we're going to get from this period are really going to help us moving forward to find out more about what we know about it. Because now we're on a more level playing field. We've not got some people working in the office, some people doing teleworking. We're all teleworking. So we will get some great data out of this. But what I'm seeing at the moment is I'm saying, I'm saying people are probably overestimating the advantages of teleworking, that it's a universal panthea. And the idea is that it's not particularly. It needs to be carefully considered, but I certainly agree with you. Once this is all over, we will see more people teleworking. But do I think it's the end of the office? No, I don't. Not yet. We're already working on online with each other, and one of the things that, that, that I miss is, from what you've said, the social aspect is there. I really do miss that. And uh, as you said, the team probably is... is, is the entire team is missing the social aspect of being in uh, in an office. So when you were talking about it, I had an idea. Like we always go onto our, onto our meeting, we do da 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 da. It's almost like we have an agenda. We finish the agenda, and then okay, goodbye. Everybody goes and work. Perhaps we need to think about actually having like almost break times or lunch time where we turn on the technology and we're not working. We're just yakking. We're just having fun, even even having lunch with each other and talking about it. And tell it just like what we do on the water, beside the water cooler or on the lunch table. We're doing that, by the way, and it is amazing. There we go. It's yeah. not a bit. It, it, we have like uh, ten to fifteen minutes. The whole the, the managers in the company. It's like blah 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 chatting which is all about okay. fun and smiling and joking and just breaking this uh, coldness of, of the, the isolation. Yeah. It's a good You're idea. Absolutely right. Yeah. These, yeah. Things, these things can help, but we need to, when we talk about virtual learning or we talk about these types of things, 
we do need to realize no matter how good this technology is. And I hope one day we get those little holograms where we have them all in a, <laughs> all in a room and we can talk to each other. But unfortunately, even with the technology, we're still not as good as face-to-face. Face-to-face still has that extra edge because we understand each other's context. We understand 100%. small moments. So we can't replicate directly face-to-face. But all these types of things can help. Dr. Tim, what about, I mean, if you're looking at, you mentioned social isolation, but if you look at different personality types, introverts for extroverts, um, are introverts, do they require that level or are they completely self-motivated enough to be able to be happily work from home? A very good question, Gaia. We do a lot of work about fitting personality types to jobs, to job roles. And there certainly is a personality type that fits working from home. And yes, you're absolutely right. More introverted people, people who are lower in openness to experience, people who are more conscientious, these types of personality profiles do work better at home. So do do you think, Dr. Tim, we're going to reach a place where during job interviews, while we're doing uh, personality assessments, we're going to start measuring whether this particular person would be good to, uh, to be a person who works from home or that is a person that we have to have a, a desk and, uh, and chair for it all. It already happens, Rifat, would you believe? And you may not even know what happens. Companies now will data mine your, so your presence on the internet. They'll come up with a personality profile for you. And if it doesn't fit your job, you may not even get, get to be interviewed. And it's another really interesting idea. And the oh European Union, they're trying to legislate against it, particularly in France, but we know it happens a lot. But we don't quite Can I add something? It. Yeah. I would like to emphasize on, on this point. At the end of the day, the IT manager in my company is sending the CEO some sort of graph. I don't know what, what the hell is this graph, but to show who are the top performer, the performer in, in the sense of who sent most e- more emails, who did more chatting, who did more video conference, who did, who more used the, 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 the MSC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is happening. I'm not joking. Yeah. Yeah. Before what, what happened in UAE here, we tried like two days uh, 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 work from home for the whole company before this, like uh, 15 days ago. And apparently the, the use of technology, the efficiency, Increased by 25 percent. Wow. Yeah, yeah, like emails, chatting, more and more and more. But I don't know till when this can last. Maybe people they were a little bit uh, uh, enthusiastic about using the technology. Maybe uh, they they feel like yes, this is something nice. This is something new. I'm sitting home, but I don't know honestly till when it will last. Uh, I have a question for Chiki. Chiki, you are in education. I know you're at the, uh, how does that affect you? How is, is the technology working for you or is it not? Um, in companies, it's usually you're working with other professionals. So keeping that professionalism there is something that's a lot easier. When it comes to children um, and teenagers, that obviously becomes a lot more of an issue. So you'll see a lot of videos online at the moment about, you know, teenagers and children and trying to do the distance education and it doesn't quite work because it doesn't they don't have the same kind of um uh, they don't have that professionalism so when it comes to getting away with things they get to get away with things and they can they can mess around a lot more there's a lot less that the teachers are able to do so for distance education it's a bit harder because you don't have that control over the children um and that presence to to really like guide it the way you'd like to in a classroom. So it does make it a lot more challenging to do it for um, students. But I think in the workplace, when you're communicating with your um, colleagues and stuff like that, it's still a really good tool to um, use. Yeah, I guess the older older you get, the better, the more disciplined you are. (laughs) Not for everyone, but hopefully. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Dr. Tim, I have another question. Um, what Husby said about um, IT monitoring graphs, so the ethical question would be, do you tell your employees you're monitoring them or do you not? And the other question is, do you think sometimes companies overcompensate in terms of monitoring because they don't have that 
seeing their employees in the workplace. Um, that sense of, I don't know, trust. Exactly. Yeah. Employee monitoring is such a big issue now because technology is meant it's so much easier to do. There's so much more data that can easily be, easily be collected. And it's an absolute minefield, to be honest. It's, it's so important to do it to make sure you guys aren't slow, social loafing, to make sure there are actually their performances being measured. But when do you go over the line? You know, should you be measuring keystrokes as some companies do now and the Keystroke. time at the office? Absolutely, though, the number of keystrokes you're doing per minute. There's some, uh, okay. should, should you have the video on them? And then, of course, that ethical dimension. Can you, uh, are you allowed to have a video in somebody's home? Now, in around Europe, these things are far more carefully regulated. In this region, far less so. So it's, an, it's, a, yeah, it's, a, it's a great debate about, about the extent of employee monitoring. And when do you lose the trust and when is it too much? Employee monitoring. You also have to really watch what sort of quality data you get because you can, sure, you can see how much someone's using a chat, but you don't necessarily know the, the content of that chat. Mm. Like, is it social? Is it people video Not calling really, that's just it. to have lunch together? Is it people video calling to discuss work? And like how effective, how efficient are those calls as well? So when you're Absolutely. getting that sort of data and those sort of reports, you also have to think about what's the quality of the data that you're getting and what is that really reflecting absolutely right is it reflecting performance or is it just data i have a little kid who is 10 right now who hasn't decided what to do i think it's going to be in data management <laughs> this is the future <laughs> yeah yeah uh, apparently the, yeah big data is one of the big one of the one of the areas that's going to need people definitely in the next few years uh, yeah a professional spy mine, <laughs> mine want to be a gardener <laughs> I think I, I want to be as, as well now, isn't it? Yeah. The less stressed, less stressed than all of us. Yeah. Smart kid. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, I better wrap it up there then. So thanks. So I hope that's food for thought for you all. And uh, I think the takeaways you've all got in there really, you just need, it does work. You just need to think about it in individual positions and occupations and organizations. It just requires thought. It's not something that will work. Uh, positively all the time. So thanks for listening, Thank guys. You so and, uh, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye.